This was a great auk, and there were some two million auks roaming in the North Atlantic region, from East US to Northern Spain. It was the age of discovery, and European explorers were trying to find new places. In around 1500 AD, they found the breeding ground of the great auks. These penguins were carefree birds. And by the way, these were the original penguins. Later, we gave that name to these ice birds. Okay, they were not aggressive, had a chill temperament, and wouldn't run away from humans. Even when they walked, it was a slow waddle. Thus, the easy hunting started. It was ideal food for travelers. Easy to catch, and a good amount of meat. Even the fat could be used as oil for lamps. Also, the food would be fresh. Travelers could keep them alive in the boats and kill them when they needed to eat. The hunting escalated, and many other travelers found out about easy food. Later in the 1700s, the pillow and mattresses from Auk Downs were high-quality luxury for nobles. So, more hunting was done. During the early 19th century, the Auk's population was on the brink of extinction. Now, Auks were extremely valuable possessions for museums and collectors. It was the mid-19th century. Auks were nowhere to be found. So, either a museum or some collector ordered a merchant named Carl Siemsen to get skins of two auks. A heavy amount was offered for that. So, Siemsen hired three guys for the job. They went to the islet of Eldi for the search. After a long search, they found a couple auks guarding their egg, so the poachers reached them. Since they didn't know humans were bad, they didn't flee from there. The two guys killed each penguin, and the third one destroyed the last egg. The skin was delivered, and the birds went extinct. The male is kept in a museum in Belgium, and the female is believed to be sold to the British Museum. Well, we killed the last two birds, just to keep them in the museum. This small mouse-sized bird was called Lyle's wren. They were only found in New Zealand. Before humans' arrival, the wren's population was already decreasing because of Polynesian rats. So the only place they were left was on Stevens Island. The water around the island had obstacles, and few ships had already crashed. So people started construction of a lighthouse. Total of 17 people belonging to three families were kept there for lighthouse operation and maintenance. One of them was a naturalist named David Lyle and he brought a pregnant cat called Tibbles with him in February of 1894. He left the cat to roam free, and she started eating the wrens. Since wrens were flightless, they couldn't flee and were easy food for the cat. She would sometimes bring the dead wren to Lyle. Lyle believed it was a new species and sent it back for identification. Then he waited for the result. Meanwhile, the cat gave birth, and the kitten started killing the wrens too. With enough food and no predators, the cat's population exploded in just a year and a half. Within late 1895, the birds were declared extinct, even before it was properly classified. The evolution of millions of years ended just because of a single pregnant cat. This mountain goat was called Pyrenean Ibex. They were found in the Pyrenean Mountains between France and Spain. These goats had beautiful curved horns, and those horns became the curse for these species. Their population was already decreasing from the 14th century, but the hunting at that time was done for food and skin. But from the early 19th century, the luxury of keeping the head as decoration for European Nobels led to the massive hunting of ibex. And by the beginning of the 20th century, it was already too late. By 1913, there were less than 100 ibex remaining in the wild. The hunting was prohibited, and a national park was established for sole purpose of their preservation in 1918. Since the population was low, the inbreeding started and genetic diversity started weakening. They started catching diseases, and it was even affecting their fertility. Or maybe it was still hunting, but they blamed genes for that. Who knows? Be any case, by 1990, less than 10 were remaining. By the late 1990s, a female ibex named Celia was the sole survivor. So. She was kept in captivity, skin samples and DNA were taken, and then she was sent back to the national park. While she was walking, a tree fell and crushed her head, and the species got extinct by that falling tree. But, since scientists had already collected the samples, they tried to clone her with the help of a female goat. The ibex was born again through the C-section, and all the scientists were overjoyed, at least for seven minutes. Then, the calf died making Pyrenean ibex the only species to go extinct twice. This is a thylacine. You may better know it as a Tasmanian tiger. 
These marsupials were the apex predators of Tasmania and were living a happy life. Then, the humans appeared, and they brought sheep with them. They started their settlements and occupied the habitat of Tasmanian tigers. The sheep farm expanded and thylacine were forced to stay away from their natural habitats. After some time, some farmers noticed the disappearance of their cattle. A few of the sheep were missing from the farm. They instantly blamed Tasmanian tigers for that problem. They even said more sheep than total were missing, and reported it to the authority. The Tasmanian government placed one pound bounty for each thylacine, without any proof or research. Then the mass hunting started. They killed thousands of thylacine and brought them to the brink of extinction. By the time they realized that it was actually feral dogs that led to the loss of sheep, all the thylacines were wiped out, except for the one in a zoo. And that guy died in 1936, making the species extinct. But many people have reported the sight of Tasmanian tigers, even today. We don't know if they are really extinct yet. Well, hope some are still surviving, far from the human sight. This kangaroo-looking guy was Two Lake Wallaby. Those who saw them believed that these were the most elegant species among all the kangaroo family. When Europeans settled in Australia, they started destroying the natural habitat. The swamp grassland was overtaken, and the wallabies had to shrink to confined space. Their pelt was a good quality material, so they started hunting them for the pelt too. And if that wasn't enough, they also introduced red fox from Europe to Australia. All these combined started eating the wallaby population, and in 1920, the wallabies were on the verge of extinction. The news of Tasmanian tigers' population decreasing rapidly was floating around. Scientists were determined not to let these species have the same fate, so they devised a plan to capture all the wallabies and breed them in captivity. The search party was made, and they started the work. After the hard search, they found 14 wallabies grazing in the swamp grassland so they launched a surprise catch attempt. The wallabies started fleeing, and the people started chasing. After a long chase, most of the wallabies collapsed of panic and exhaustion, and they died. Just a couple of survivors were taken to the captivity. Scientists tried their best to breed the remaining ones, but they couldn't succeed. They started dying. The last female died in 1939, making the species extinct. The act of conservation actually led to the extinction of wallabies. This was Lonesome George, and he was the last remaining member of Pinta Island tortoise. There used to be a lot of tortoises in the island of Pinta, but humans used to hunt them for food and oil. After goats were introduced to the island, they ate all the grass, and no food was left for the tortoises to eat. So the species was believed to be extinct. But a Hungarian scientist named Josef Vagvelgi found him on the island. It sparked a ray of hope. He was instantly taken to Charles Darwin Research Station on Santa Cruz Island for conservation. He lived there for around 40 years. To continue the generation, they brought two females of the wolf volcano subspecies to mate with him in 1992. George ignored the females for a long time and didn't mate with them. But later in 2008, humans assisted, and he did mate with the females. Maybe it was the result of disinterest. The eggs were not fertilized, and no kids were hatched. They again brought two more females of Espanola Island tortoise in 2011, but he didn't mate with them too. And around a year later, this master Ugwe went to the spirit realm, My time has come. marking the end of his species. And as always, I love you guys.